Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Joining me on today's Your Take is an award-winning journalist, author, and broadcaster. My guest has written on sport, mainly football, for the Sunday Times for over 20 years. During that time, he has written on summer sports, most spectacular moments, and interviewed countless sporting icons. He's also one of Britain's leading music writers, who currently writes for Mojo, Q, and Classic Rock. He's also written and co-written a number of published books on various musical subjects. He's interviewed countless pop stars from the past three decades, including Kate Bush, Elton John, Depeche Mode, Joe Strummer, Pink Floyd, and Amy Winehouse. He's been a regular contributor for The Guardian, The Independent, 442, Arena, FHM, and a face you may recognize from television or will be revealed later. John Azelwood joins me today to talk about his illustrious writing career, his love of music and sport, his experience talking to celebrities, and his adventures in television broadcasting. Hot off the press this morning. Very nice to, to see you. Thank you for joining me on this kind of cold Tuesday, January day. Good to see you. Hello there. Good to be here. Yeah, we've we've kind of in we've interviewed many people from kind of many careers and backgrounds and, and different guises. But you're the first person we've spoken to from the journalistic world. So I'm interested to hear your story with your career, particularly focusing on music and uh, sport as well, particularly football. But I wanted to go back to the very beginning, turn the clock back many, many years to your upbringing. And I kind of wanted to begin by asking you where you were born and just to get a bit of a, a background on your parents, who they were, what they did for a living, and do you have any siblings? Well, I was born on a, the, the, the borders of Rotherham and Sheffield far too long ago. And my parents were, were quite ordinary people. They weren't writers. They weren't especially creative. My dad was a milkman. And he, of course, that meant that he, he worked every day, but, but one in the year. And I think I kind of got my work ethic from that too. And he, he also decided that when I became a teenager, that it would be a fantastic idea if for a very small amount of money, I were to work on the milk crown with him too. So I did that and that meant that I had a little bit of spare cash, slightly more spare cash than my, my peers had really. And this meant that I could spend it on the things that I liked, i.e. music and football. So it was really, it was pretty straightforward upbringing. And I just discovered these things myself. I was a very curious little boy, uh, curious in the sense of wondering what things were about, but probably curious in another way too, because you know, a comprehensive school in Rotherham is not necessarily a great breeding ground for being creative, for being a writer. And at school, that was the, they were the, the writing things, the writing subjects, English and religious education and history. They were the subjects that I was really drawn to, partially because, and I think this may be a running thing, they were the only things I was any good at. I wanted to kind of come on to your schooling, but before we do so, I wanted to ask a bit about your mum, what she did for, for a living as well, and also talk about your school years, um, where you were educated, and I kind of wanted to ask you, were you um, a natural academic? You've mentioned some of the, the subjects you excelled in, but after finishing school, did you kind of go on to further education? Well, I mean, my mum was more, mostly a housewife. She was someone who, because in those days, which is a terrible phrase to use, of course, but in those days, then there were more stay-at-home mums. And that's what she did. She had the occasional temporary job. But her job, I think, was just to, to nurture, really. There was me and my brother. And she made sure that we had 
stuff to eat. We weren't very wealthy, we weren't well off at all, but we're, there, there's not a kind of hard scrabble story to this. It was all right, it was reasonably comfortable. And the school I went to was a, a, a standard comprehensive school in Rotherham. It was called Oakwood, and at the time, I think it was one of the, the better schools in Rotherham. And I, I, it's not a question of being academic. I never felt like that I was. But what I did feel, uh, particularly when it came towards the exam period, was that the, the only way out of a, a lower middle class existence in Rotherham was through education. And that kind of concentrated my mind a bit. So although I wasn't naturally gifted, although I wasn't brilliant, I did understand, I was smart enough to understand that education was the key. And I was fairly smart enough to understand that the subjects that I were good at were the ones that I really ought to be concentrating on. I wanted to ask you next, did you originally set out to become a journalist and writer? And if so, what kind of attracted you to journalism? And did you study in the field before going, going on to work as a journalist? Well, I knew, a, I, I, if you take it back to English at school, I knew I liked English. But when I did my O-levels, as they were then, then I got A's in English language and English literature. And mm. this was an absolute shock. I had no idea, because there wasn't that sense of, parents intervening in education there wasn't that sense of, of nurturing in that way so it was a surprise and then I did realize that that this was maybe the way forward to have a proper career I was virtually numerate I couldn't do anything with maths I was useless with my hands so I couldn't do anything practical and this did seem it, it seemed like the way out so those early years have been at school and at, at, at sixth form college then they, they were geared towards me leaving the the area that I was brought up in, leaving South Yorkshire, ideally in a, in a few years hence, going to London. But I knew that I had to put some work in there to get out because nothing else I thought was ever going to happen for me. It's interesting that you mentioned this love of writing and it was something that you were kind of, was natural. It was something that you kind of maybe excelled in more than other subjects, but... On the topic of writing, were you kind of an avid book reader at the time? And were there any particular novelists or journalists or any other writers that kind of inspired you or kind of championed you in any way that you kind of wanted to follow in similar footsteps or do something of that capacity? Well, I, I, I avidly, of course, read the music press. There were the, the, the three music papers, Melody, Melody Maker, Enemy and Sounds. And of course, I devoured those because they were like the, they were the soundtrack to the music that I, I was listening to as well. But also I began to kind of get into writing and there was this extraordinary advertisement in, in either the Enemy or Sounds one week. And it said that if you send this coupon off, you will receive a free copy of this new novel. And the new novel was Life According to Garb by John Irving. And because it was free, I sent off. The book duly turned up. And I think it actually changed my life. And I read it a few years ago and it didn't, didn't have quite the same resonance that it did as a, as a teenager. But just reading, reading these beautiful words, this incredible story that he was, he was weaving. I think that was the first time since possibly reading The Hobbit as a, as a 10 year old that was the first time I really understood how great writing can change your life and it mm. can galvanize it and I never really aspired to be a fiction writer but I think reading reading life according to Garp I just I understood what great writing could be and what kind of effect it could have on you as a person and to be able to do that to be able to get people to read your words that's an extraordinary thing. It's an astonishing privilege to have people in, in, their, in their homes. You know, you, 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 your writing goes into people's homes. And that's a, an extraordinary uh, privilege. It's a great thing to do. It, and you have to kind of curate that because, we, because it's a privilege also comes with it, I think, responsibility. And that's part of trying to 
uh, it sounds almost naive, but trying to do the best that you can all the time. Because you are sharing this, it's not introverted. It's an extrovert thing, bizarrely. Even though writing is, is can be quite a lonely experience, you're doing it to be read by other people. And I think that that's, that's what I understood by reading this John Irving novel. Your written work has been obviously read in many homes across many magazines, many newspaper publications, and we're going to talk in some depth about your journalistic and writing career. But before I kind of delve into those areas, I wanted to kind of ask you, before you got your break, what kind of jobs did you work as before you became a, a writer for the, for the press and so forth? And I kind of wanted to specifically go back in time and ask you, how did your breakthrough in journalism happen? And what was your first journalistic role? Well, there were no, there were no jobs in South Yorkshire in the, the, the mid and late 80s. There really weren't. Employment was, was endemic. But I did, I did manage to get a, a job as a door-to-door -door salesman. Um, based, <laughs> the payment was exclusively commission, which was, of course, very disappointing because, as you may or may not imagine, I was absolutely useless at it. I, I used to get these terrible stomach cramps before going on, on my rounds with a, a, you know, I didn't have a suit. I didn't have a suit. I didn't look smart. I tried, I tried it, but it never worked. You know, clothes don't really fit on a 16, 17 year old boy. So, or yeah. certainly didn't fit on this 16, 17 year old boy. I had to pluck up courage to go and literally knock on people's doors and try and sell them a, a, a better wear catalogue which was all these mildly overpriced ha household uh, fixtures. And they'd hopefully take a catalogue and then a week later I would trot along and invariably, of course, they uh, lost the catalogue. They couldn't be bothered to order or they simply didn't remember me turning up in the first place. It was astonishingly dispiriting. I did get some sales, but I have a feeling that they were mainly, mainly through uh, sympathy rather than my fantastic sales technique. <laughs> but also later on, when I, was at, when I was at university, because we didn't have any money, so I was on a full grant at university in those days when they did grants, not loans. Then I got a Saturday job and I worked in a bookmaker's. And in those days, it wasn't all electronic. It wasn't automated. They used to have a giant whiteboard, absolutely giant. And you would write, or I would, because I was the board boy, you'd write the prices uh, of, of the horses as it, it, as it fluctuated before the race. When the race happened, then you'd write the winner, the price it came, that it came in at. And you had to be, you had to think on your feet. I mean, I'm not saying it was a great intellectual challenge, but at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, I'd step back look at the board and the, the, the board, you know, it was the size of a giant wall. It was literally the whole wall in a Ladbroke shop. And that was my work. I'd written all that. And of course, I had to write neatly because I'd got all these uh, very keen punters in front of me. And they obviously wanted to read exactly. So bizarrely, for a brief moment, it tidied up my writing skills, so as my actual handwriting skills because I was writing for them. I loved working at the bookmakers, it was brilliant. And then when I, after I left university, then I came to London in order to, to try and make it in the big city or whatever romantic phrase you want to use. Of course, again, I had no money. So I, I, I passed my, my driving test. And the very next day after passing my driving test, I became a, a, a driver. I used to drive car parts around. Now, of course, I'd never driven before. They said at the interview, uh, how long you've been driving? And I said, four years. Now, this, of course, was technically true because four years ago, I had uh, taken and failed my driving test twice. Okay. I hadn't driven for three years. And then I'd fluked my way through my third driving test. So the day, so the day after, oh, I, I, I was in central London driving car parts around every single day. Now that's of course, uh, toughened up my driving skills very, very quickly. There were a couple of scrapes, but again, it was a job that I quite liked actually, because I, I listened to the radio in the car uh, and uh, I didn't take too much intellectual capacity. Once I'd found, I didn't know London, of course. So once I'd found out all the routes now to get to places, then I enjoyed it a lot. And it meant that I had quite a bit of spare time and I could slowly move 
because I knew at this stage that I, I, I wanted to do something in writing, particularly music journalism, because music mm. is the, the thing that I, I know about. I hadn't had any journalistic qualifications whatsoever. And I just tried to write for music papers. I sent, I used to go to gigs and send them reviews and saying, you know, you don't have to print it, please don't print it, but could I write for you if you like this review? And eventually people at, at Sounds and then at Melody Maker, they said yes. And I started doing the occasional review, you know, the, the absolute, the, the bottom feeders of, of the music industry, very tiny bands in very tiny venues. But of course, to me, to me, it was the biggest thing ever, the most important thing that anybody could review. You know, I'd go to, to pub, pubs and see bands playing to 20 people and they'd write something for, for Melody Maker. And I thought that was so exciting. It was the most exciting thing. And then a few days later, you'd actually see it. You'd see it in the paper. You'd see your name in the press. And that was a, a astonishing sensation. And I realized that this is what I wanted to do full time. And then, uh, and there were a lot more, the, the music press was, was easier to get into in those days, sure. chiefly because there were many, many more publications and they all had reasonable editorial budgets and they were looking for someone who would do anything. And I was that someone who would do anything so i wrote for for other magazines and then then i think that the the, the big break that I, I i got was writing for number one and this was a pop magazine it was like the second to smash hits it, it, its slogan was uh, our strength is our weakliness because it came out once a week as opposed to smash hits which of course came out every fortnight and from there then suddenly partially because i was the guy who could do anything i wasn't prejudiced against any sorts of music. Mm. I was the one who they, they sent to do interview after interview after interview. This meant I could give up my, my job and I could not making a lot of money at all, but writing about music was suddenly taking up all my time. And I was, you know, I was, I was making enough to live and that's all I cared about. So I was doing two or three interviews a week with pop stars. And that was, that was like serving an apprenticeship almost. Because, you know, one week for, for number one, I'd do uh, someone like Timmy Mallet, who was having hits in those days. And then the next day... Whack, whack a day, I can remember yes, very yes. fondly as a, a, young, a young boy going back, yeah. Yeah, so I'd do Timmy Mallet one day, and then I'd do Sisters of Mercy the next day. And that gave a fantastic grounding, one in the, in the Catholicism of music itself, which always had this Catholic taste, but in actually interviewing different people. And it was, it was sort of churning them out a bit, but oh, I just, I absolutely loved it. And then eventually they, they, started, they started sending me to places. You know, I'd never been on a plane before I worked for number one. And then incredibly, incredibly, they sent me to Scotland on the plane to interview China Crisis. And I, I thought that this was the, the best thing that had ever, ever happened to me. And then eventually they start sending me to other places. They even sent me abroad. I had to get a passport. Crikey. Imagine that. I want to pick up um, slightly later on um, some of the people you've interviewed over the years and about interviewing as well. But I want to talk in a bit more detail about your love of music, which has been a, a common theme in our conversation already. And obviously your love of sport, but particularly football. But I wanted to ask you about your earliest memories of music. And I also wanted to ask you, are you a musician yourself? And if you had to cite some of your favourite artists, who would they be and why? Um, I, I'm not a musician myself. I haven't got a, a, a talent or a, a, an inclination. It, it's, I know there's, there's, there's a few music journalists who are frustrated musicians. I'm not sure. one of those. I've never had the remotest bit of interest. You know, I, and the, only, the only things I've, I've done have been sort of part of journalism. You know, I, 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 I sang, and I, I, I use the word sing advisedly, but I, I sang backing vocals on a, a Hothouse Flowers B-side course they didn't credit me and I'd imagine there's a reason for that. Um, I, I, you know, I sang again sang 
is the operative word, uh, uh, to uh, in a football stadium in Brazil with Iron Maiden. Great, they made well. Wow. Perhaps, perhaps they turned my mic down. I don't know, but I was there and I, and I was doing the singing, fist in the air, sort of uh, a, a sensible distance from Bruce Dickinson, of course. But <laughs> that's not because I've got any talent at anything. It's be, it's part of the, the the journalistic experience. So no, I, I'm not a frustrated musician. No interest. Don't can't play a note on any instrument. But that doesn't mean that there hasn't always been this abiding love of music you know when i was a kid and we went on holiday i i got a small holiday allowance sort of 20 pence a day or whatever it was to to purchase an ice cream or some cockles or whatever from bridlington seafront and i didn't didn't do any of that not at all i saved the money until the last day then i could go to a record shop and buy an album with all the money that I'd saved. And this is a sort of nine-year-old, 10-year-old boy. So I made this massive sacrifice. Of course, it seems, it seems foolish now, but I made this massive sacrifice. And then I came home with an album from Holiday. And, you know, my parents can really understand how I'd done this because I was doing it quite quietly. And obviously I wasn't suffering or anything because we were on holiday, but I would come home with albums. You know, one year I came home with the, the, the Beach Boys' greatest hits. You know, I must have been about 10 or 11. Wow, imagine that, because I'd, I'd fallen in love with the, the reissued Good Vibrations, which became a hit many years after its, its original release. And I had no idea who the Beach Boys were or anything. And it's just remarkable music from California coming through the speakers. I just, wow. You know, another year I came home with uh, Kimono My House by Sparks. And again, I got into it through the singles, This Town and Amateur Art. And on this, there's this come out of my house. The rest of it is absolutely extraordinary, even to this day. So I was doing, I was essentially trying to educate myself in music. And I was never particularly tribal. I sort of came out of the, mm. the, the punk and, and new wave years. But even as a kid, even as a kid, you know, I was going to see, I was going to see the, the Damned and the Clash and the Jam and those bands. But when it came to, for example, my 18th birthday, I spent my 18th birthday watching Shack Attack at Sheffield Limit Club. And lest we forget, Shack Attack were absolutely fantastic. Nightbirds, great record. Just as good as anything on Machine Good et Etiquette or London Calling. On the, the flip side to your love of music, I wanted to delve into the, the football side as well. And I wanted to ask you, how long you've been interested in, in football and did you play competitively? Do you follow a team and do you have any stand, standout memories from any live matches or players you've witnessed over your many years of, of loving the beautiful game? Well, uh, I've been interested in football. I've loved football since, since I could walk. However, my problem was, was that I was that's absolutely useless 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 and of course i i played the for uh, every day almost until i was about 15 or 16 however i was still useless it wasn't certainly wasn't through want of trying it certainly wasn't nothing to do with time spent on the field and uh, there were no there were no leagues in those days for for kids or there wasn't in my area anyway and so i and that meant that me and my friends played football like I said, every single day, and I was still useless. And you, know, you, you have to accept that. A, it's, it's not a matter of opinion. I was rubbish, properly, properly rubbish. But I supported Sheffield Wednesday, and my dad got us season tickets for the non-glory years when they were in the old Division Three, And we saw game after game after game. And honestly, it was properly rubbish it was bad not as bad as I was nothing's as bad as that but by the professional standards it was pretty awful but it was a great thing for me and my dad to do you know and then after the game he'd take me and we'd get the we'd hang outside and I'd get people's autographs in my autographs book that sort of thing that's what we'd do and it was an absolutely brilliant thing and then slowly slowly I started going on my own I used to go to an awful lot of Wednesday away games then with and I, yeah, I'd made friends they were, they were really close friends and we'd go all over the country together they were mostly minors but I could finance it because I was as I said before working on my dad's milk ground 
so I had a bit of money and they you know they give me money and they they'd sort of buy me underage drinks and things like that and we'd go all over the country together first on the coaches and then on the the service trains and I had an absolute ball and these were the great times and then slowly you know Wednesday began to get quite good and then that's where I think you have the, the real football memories you know you have the memory of the, the awful Wednesday team in the old division three you know I was there at Wednesday's lowest ever crowd which was against uh, Colchester in I think 76 and but also they started to get better you know I was there that night when they, they booked promotion to the the old division two when they went away at Blackburn and they went 2-1 you know I think that was probably at the mo that moment the greatest night of my life and I think it also goes for a lot of other people who were there that night it was this great cathartic experience you know Wednesday had been down for so long and suddenly the climb back was beginning and they're the, they're the sort of they're the real memories and then but the notion of actually writing about football that that was something I didn't really have it was so far away and I knew and I looked at it and I knew that it was from people who were say properly trained in journalism and for a long, long time, I had no idea how to, to go about that. And that will come later in our, our tale, obviously. But it was, it was something that I, I looked at with envy because I thought I might be able to, to do this, particularly once I, I started doing uh, music journalism permanently, you know, because obviously I was, I was staff at uh, Q for a long time in the, in the glory days. Not, of course, the glory days because I was there, but I was part of it. Incredibly, you go from the young boy stood on the, the terrace, the memories, the matches, the highs and lows. You mentioned waiting for the, the players to sign your autograph book to this amazing career as a football correspondent. And I wanted to talk specifically about working for the, the Sunday Times for over a period of 20 years. But I wanted to ask how that opportunity came about. And do you have any highlights from your career, such as the stories, sorry, the stories you've covered, people you've interviewed over many, 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 many years, and also things you've discovered about the game that maybe you weren't aware of before working as a, a football journalist? Well, get the opportunity to, to write for the Sunday Times came after I'd, I'd written a book. I wrote a book called Playing at Home. And in it, there were several chapters which were a sort of my attempt at, at football journalism, at match reporting. And I, I thought that this might be a good idea to show to some sports editors that uh, look, this is how I'd be able to write if I were to, to write for you. And I, I, I sent stuff off to people and at the Sunday Times. The, the sports editor at the time, Alex Butler, he wrote back and said that he'd, he'd, read, he'd actually read the book, which was a, a, astonishing to me. He was, he, I was hugely flattered by it. And he said, yeah, come on then. Um, why don't you start writing for us? And I'd never done it before. I did sort of a whole new world. I'd never been in a press box before. And you're kind of, you're kind of left to, to fend for yourself because I, I couldn't quite bring myself to admit to him that I had no experience whatsoever, that I'd just written a book. And I hadn't written these, these, the match report aspects of the book from a press box or anything. I'd written them while standing on the terrace or sat in the stands with a piece of paper in my hand. Uh, but I slowly realized that, it, that, that I was quite good at this. And that it's that say football match reporting was something that I could do. And then I, I slowly expanded, got into writing about uh, writing features, about interviewing people and also doing writing about other sports, too, because, uh, you know, obviously my primary interest and area of expertise is football. But I'm also fantastically curious about other sports. So mm -hmm. been able to write about, say, Formula One, you know, netball, netball is great, oh, not netball and speedway, the best smelling sport in the world it smells absolutely astonishing those bikes when they come out it's brilliant and uh, you know i've done show jumping done all sorts of things darts 
Um, and I just, I love writing about that competitive gladiatorial aspect of sport. On the aspect of football coverage and just sport in general, would you say that journalism has changed much during your tenure as a correspondent? And I also wanted to ask about your take on the success and longevity of the English Premier League. And overall, do you think it's been an overall positive effect on the game? And how would you kind of, in your time, obviously reporting on, on football and seeing the, the changes and how the game's developed, do you think the, the Premier League overall has been a, a positive from the old days of the, what was it, the, the old first division at the time, which was disbanded around about, I think, 91, 92? Mm. Um, I mean, football journalism has, has changed. When I got into it, it was sort of the last gasp era at the time when journalists and footballers were incredibly close, when they'd hang out together, when they'd drink together, when they, the journalists would keep the secrets of, of the football. And this meant also that in, in press boxes, there were a lot of older guys who were very, very fond of drinking. There was that old culture, the drink and cigar culture. There was one, there was one press room in the, in, in the Premier League that actually had a bottle of whiskey on, on the wall and these old school journalists would just take nip after nip after nip of whiskey and I was sort of jaw dropped about this because I've never, never been able to, to drink and write, I, it's not, not something I can do even if I wanted to and there was that last gasp of the old school but since then um, particular match reporting and obviously I, I do, do match reporting for the Daily and Sunday Telegraph as well now and that that has changed too. The technology has changed. That that old old school idea of people carrying their typewriters and phoning in to copy takers. That's all gone now. It's much more technological. And I think quite a lot of that old school couldn't really master the the technological aspects of it. And now, of course, everybody is totally au fait with it and totally uh, enthralled. In, in to whatever Wi-Fi facilities the clubs provide, which isn't always great, but it's, 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 a, it's a, a lot, lot, lot better than it was. It used to be an absolute nightmare trying to simply get an, a, an internet connection at a football ground. Now it's much better regulated. But there's also another aspect to it as well, which coincides with the, the growth of the Premier League. And that's, that's the, the, the distance between footballers and the people who are writing about football has, grow there's uh, there's the suggestion that journalists uh, and footballers are mates with, with yeah there's everybody has an exception or two but it's not like it was there isn't that closeness access to players is much more controlled than it was you know you, the journalists used to sort of hang around outside the ground or just turn up outside the dressing room and have a chat now it's much much more formal Sorry, I wanted to ask you something on that note. When you say it's become more and more difficult with the players, are they pretty much controlled by PR agents now and you're kind of vetted on what questions you can and cannot ask? Well, each, each club from the highest to the lowest employ has a, a, a media department and they control access to players you know there are slightly way around it sometimes by our agents but generally not because it's uh, clubs obviously you know, sorry players don't want to to upset their employers and also you know even most players understand that that the way that they can gain uh, the way that they can advance their career is by what they do on the pitch that me writing an article about them saying what a lo lovely articulate man they are that counts for nothing if they play a stinker on Saturday. And that's the difference between football and, and music. If people, if musicians talk to you, then it does, it helps their career. It encourages people to buy their records and to buy their, their concert tickets. It's an absolute positive boon for them. But for, for sports people, it's not. And I, I think they, they all understand that. And so therefore the clubs have realised, now I'm not sure if realised is the right word, but the clubs have come to the, the notion that controlling access to players is a good idea. And going through them, then of course you have to go through the clubs. Some people want to know 
what sort of questions you ask. Press officers uh, from football clubs often sit in with inter uh, at interviews. You know, press officers for, for musical acts, even the absolute the top level superstar acts, press officers don't sit in. You know, the journalist can have a little tantrum saying you're not sitting in. What we're going to do with, with with footballers and sports people, you can't really do that. And maybe it's because they don't trust the footballers to be articulate enough. I don't know, but they need. But clubs are quite keen to to control what goes out about them. On the the subject of interviewing, I kind of want to turn back to music and talk about some of the prolific and interesting people you've interviewed over many years in the in music and we've mentioned some of the the names at the beginning of the interview people like Elton John for example Kate Bush George Michael Pink Floyd Amy Winehouse the many many names what's the experience overall been like talking to major celebrities and pop artists who would you cite as the most interesting and successful interviews you've conducted and have you had any bad experiences to date? Well, if, you, if you're interviewing sort of the absolute elite level, then you have, as an interviewer, you've got a lot going for you because they're not going to let some kid do it who's straight out of journalist college. Um, so you must be at a reasonable level to interview someone who's, who's pretty famous. But also, the more famous you are, the fewer interviews you have to do. This means that when you do do them, then you put a certain amount of effort into it, that you're not generally sat in a hotel room doing 10 interviews a day, 30 minutes strictly timed with often people who don't speak the same language as you. Uh, so that, so the, the, the higher you go, to a sense, the better it is. But you're, there's, there's several different types of really uh, famous interviewees there is someone like elton john he's a great example of it he's astonishing to interview absolutely phenomenal he speaks in sentences which is great for for an interviewer he answers every question and he's full of opinions and and he's laugh out loud funny he's sort of everything that you hoped elton john would be and he goes through everything he goes through everything it's absolutely marvelous he can turn it on but the, the, the difficulties, some of the difficulties that you can have, and often this is not necessarily at Elton John's level, but with people who, who struggle with fame. And we're, uh, we're a lot more responsive towards that and a lot more understanding. But you know, I, uh, the only person I've ever drawn a blank from is Kurt Cobain. And he, he was someone, you know, just at the point where uh, never mind, and smells like Teen Spirit were taking off, mm. and he was just at the, at the point where global fame was coming. Now, some acts, some artists, absolutely embrace that. You know, it's what they always wanted, and <laughs> they will give you everything in that, that first flush of fame. They're so overwhelmed and so delighted by it. Their dreams are coming true at that point. It's not that that moment three or four albums later where things are getting sour, the band has split up, they, they, they've experienced drink and drugs, and they're, they're having a critical backlash. This is the moment when all the lights are turning green for them, and that's great. But someone like Kurt Cobain, I think it's fair to say that he never really wanted or courted fame. Didn't mean he didn't want his records to sell. He was fiercely ambitious this way. We mustn't forget it. But what he didn't want, he didn't want the trimmings. You know, he didn't want me, as I, I did coming up on a, a, a train to Newcastle to interview him. He just didn't want it. And, you know, I booked the interview uh, and it was all arranged. There, were, there was no PR there. It was all going to be quite straightforward. But it wasn't. He just refused to speak. And if someone literally refuses to speak, I won't answer the question, why won't you speak? Then there's sort of nothing you can do. Mm. You have to, you, it's, it's, I don't mind a surly interviewer. That's great because they're revealing accidentally quite a lot about themselves. But someone who won't talk, and uh, he just sat there in a corner staring at me. And the, the, you know, there's a photographer there too. Um, and we weren't winging it. We, this, this was a, 
uh, 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 the major Nirvana interview was going to be the, the biggest British interviews with with King magazine, which uh, I was on the staff at at the time. Um, and he wouldn't do it. And he started going through these, these weird actions. He got this massive, great box of cornflakes and he stood on a table and poured this box of, they opened the box of cornflakes and poured the, the, the contents onto a carpet. Then, then, and all the time he was just staring at me, then he got some orange juice and he opened the bottle, poured all the orange juice onto the cornflakes and then from the table took this flying and, and frankly rather brilliant leap, a, a gymnastic roll into this mixture of orange juice and cornflakes and sort of stood up and the, the, you know, the orange juice is running down his face. He's got cornflakes stuck to his cheek and he still hasn't said anything. He's just staring at me. And <clears throat> yeah, I could write about that. It's fine, it made for a great piece, but that, that, was, that was the only time I, I've never really been able to come up with it, but because he wouldn't speak. And there's simply nothing you can do in those cases. But there's also another, set of, of, of really famous people and I think say Beyonce is a good example of that that you will you'll have your time with Beyonce she's lovely absolutely lovely get on fine uh, and she seems to be answering all your questions but she's been so kind of well media trained and so deft in her answers that you get home you play the tape and realize that she said a lot but she hasn't really said much at all uh, that was, I think, it, that also that was in the days. It was the days when she was, was post destiny, sort of post destiny child, when she was just beginning to sell squillions of records as a, as a solo artist. And I think she's probably someone who's much more interesting now than she was then. I think her way of dealing with this uh, stardom, that was superstardom, that, that was beginning to embrace her, was to be quite defensive and not to give anything away that would, would shake the image. But I think now. I mean, obviously I haven't, I haven't spoken to her for, for many, many years, but I think now she would be much more interesting because she has realized that she can use her, her fame and visibility to make other points. And you see that, I think, on, on, on her Lemonade album. I wanted to kind of move on and ask you your, your thoughts on the future of written newspaper journalism. I kind of wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what does the future hold for written newspaper journalism and the printing of newspapers in your view. I also kind of wanted to ask you, in addition, is a free press still essential today? And do you feel there's less trust in certain quarters of the press today compared to when you started as a journalist those many years ago? Um, I think news, newspaper journalism, there's, it's always been in crisis ever since I started writing for newspapers. There's always been this, uh, we're coming to the end of the, the era of print and it's, it's never quite happened. But, you know, wages are down, fees are down, sales are down, advertising is down and budgets are down. And that's almost kind of self-defeating, you know, you give the readers less and they're less inclined to pay for it. A, a, of course they are and yet um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm terribly worried about it but I have been terribly worried about it for 20 years I, I'm still surprised that all the, the newspapers are, are with us obviously the, the, the independent is, is gone online but the, the fact that the newspapers are still going is an extraordinary testament to the res resilience of the medium and the people who work for it now you know, free journalism, the, the, the giving away of free newspapers. So if you're on the tube going into London, for example, you will see in, in, in pre-COVID times, of course, you see that everyone on the carriage is reading a newspaper, but very, very few people have actually paid for the newspaper that they're reading. And the, the notion too, that you, you can get your news for free. That's, that's there's such a misconception in that, that, it had journalism has to be funded somehow and it has to be funded by you the reader paying for it you know of course I, I, I go on the BBC's website of course I do but every time someone goes on the, the BBC's website then they are making it less likely that they will have purchased a newspaper today mm. and I, I 
also, I worry about the generational gap too, that you have a, a generation of, of people and I, I, I don't really want to put an age on it, but maybe, maybe it's sort of under forties who have grown up never ever buying a newspaper. And that I think is incredibly dangerous. But we were saying this 20 years ago and the, the, the newspapers have still just about survived in slender form. And I, I mean, the, the, the idea of trust is, it's sort of, it's in the eye of, of, of the beholder really. You know, lots of people say don't trust the Daily Mail because they see it as a, as a, a right wing rag. But on the other hand, lots of people don't trust the Guardian because they see it as a, as a left wing rag. So it often, that, that, that idea of trust often ties in to the reader's uh, prejudice. And of course, if you know, things like, the, 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 the when press scandals happen, and of course that's damaging for everyone. But people tend to read, I think, newspapers that in the main conform to their own world view. And I don't think that'll ever change. So that the, 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 idea, of, the idea of trust is slightly, I think, misleading on this. I wanted to talk about another string to your bow because you're a very familiar face on television, mainly programmes as a, a music commentator and a, a talking head. Do you enjoy working in television? And what made you venture into this area? Um, well, that's, I mean, that's very, very kind of you to say so. I mean, for, for someone who obviously has got a face for radio, really, then I, I am lucky enough to be on television a bit. And I, you know, you, you, when I was, when I was, particularly when I was working at Q, then you did get a, a lot of offers because people do want some sort of expert voice. But like everyone else, I think it's about building relationships that you do go on, come talk in sentences. I do properly research for the things that I, I, I'm on. And I think people, people keep asking me back, um, which I'm immensely flattered by and yes I do like it because it, for the most part then you're, you're building relationships with people you know it's often people that I've worked with before people that I, I work with regularly like the stuff that I, I do on Sky Arts then they're, they're, they're kind of they're all good people and it's nice to work with and like like writing you have to know what the, the important thing is what your publication wants and when you're doing television I think the important thing is what the people are making the program want and if you can deliver that, great. One thing I've kind of failed to mention so far in our conversation is, again, another area that you've um, worked in and specialised in on a number of occasions, and that's being an author and co-author of a number of books. Which projects are you most proud of? And what are the challenges involved in writing a, a factual essay or a biography or a study on a specific subject? Well, uh, I've, I've just got I've got a new book out actually called Decades, which is the story of Joy Division and New Order, and I, I, I very much enjoyed writing that. That's the first time that, that this story has been told by someone who's not in the band. You know, everyone's had a go at writing the, the Joy Division New Order tale. You know, the, the bassist has written a couple of books, the drummer's written two books. The, the, the wife of the Joy Division singer has written a book. The New Order singer has written a book, but no one has come at it from that kind of neutral perspective. Mm. So I, that's the beauty of that. And it looks great. There's loads of brilliant photos in it, none of which are, I've chosen or anything like that, but it looks fantastic. So I'm very proud of that, but I'm proud too of, of uh, a book called Playing at Home, which I mentioned before, which I did, which is me going to the, the uh, home league match of all of the 92 clubs in one season. And then a little bit earlier than that, there's a book which I edited called Love is the Drug, which was people, including myself, but people writing, authors and musicians and, and music writers, writing about their, their love of a particular act as they grew up, something that meant so much to them, hence, hence the title there. And I think it's it, getting books published is more, it's, it's more about selling the idea that you have uh i mean i've got i've got a radiohead book coming out later later this year luckily enough i was asked to do that but most for the, the the most part it's it's you coming up with a with a great idea 
and people buying into it. And I think that's that's to me what makes a, a, a successful book. But each book too, each book has a different challenge. So those challenges, be it a, an essay or a study or a biography, they're different depending on who you're dealing with. So for example, you're writing about Joy Division and then that's some great music, not very much great music because they, they canon is, is so small, but it's also there's the tragedy of the, the, the singer killing himself. Whereas say if you're writing about Radiohead, then obviously they're ongoing. They're a band whose, whose lineup has never really changed. And so you're writing about a story of, of progression. There is there's this sort of hints of tragedy, but it's not really about that. It's about how this extraordinary, <coughs> sorry, how this extraordinary band came to sell so many records, making such uncompromising music. So each, each story that you tell, and this applies to when you're, you're interviewing people as well, they're all different because everyone has a different tale. Shortly, we come on to the final quickfire 13 questions that we ask all your take guests, and we kind of ask them things they don't like, things they do like, the favourite things in their lives, places, films, all that kind of thing. But my final question, John, is how do you look back at your career and what do you think the future holds for you? And what would your advice be to anyone who's looking to become a journalist in today's world? Um, I did, I, I, this is, I'm not trying to be evasive here, but I tend not to look back not yet. I think there's a time. There's a time to come. You know, those when, when I can no longer dress myself and no longer get out of bed. They're the times to, to, to spend, I think, looking back. I save all my cuttings and I just loads of them. I, haven't, I don't look at them. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's been on a domestic level. It's been explained to me that this is quite a foolish, uh, a very anal thing to do. But I don't care. They're there. and They're in plastic bags. They're in the shed. Yeah, one day I'd like to go back and 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 look at them. I mean, in terms of what the future holds, then I don't know. You know, it's 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 like that. It's it's uh, hopefully speaking absolutely personally that I am reasonably well established. That the that you know my name just carry a little a little weight, and I'd like to I'd like to build up from there. But I'm still as excited about writing as I always was. It's a, the love affair that's never ended. And I still, yeah, the idea of getting up in the morning and either interviewing someone or writing about someone or reviewing a book or, a, or an album or going to a football match. God, I'm so excited about it still. So you know, if you can keep that, that sense of excitement, then great, it's, it, is, it is a way to making, making yourself happy. In terms of anyone looking to be a journalist now, I mean, my, the flip answer is don't, because it's it's hard out there, and you have uh, rafts of qualified media studies person people coming out with a qualification, believing that they're going to get a job, and at the moment in the printed world, there just aren't that many jobs available. So there's an awful lot of people who are asking what flavour your pizza would like. You'd, you'd like when they're, they've got a, a journalistic qualification. But I think if you are, you have to embrace broadcast. You have to embrace online and digital, but you have to find a way to get paid from that. And I did stuff for free when I started out and I couldn't possibly criticize anyone for doing writing for free in their early stages. But there is a moment where, you know, it's a job. It's a job. If you've got a plumber coming around to fix your radiator, who would expect to pay them? You uh, that you wouldn't say, well, this is great exposure. When I tweet about how great you are at changing radiators, you expect to pay them. And uh, the, the same, I think, should apply to journalism as much as possible. But if people aren't pay, prepared to pay for journalism, that means the journalists don't get paid. And that absolutely kills and crushes both standards of reporting and quality in writing. Interesting note to, to end on, and I agree with your sentiment. We've spoken to kind of a number of guests in kind of the creative fields, and I suppose you can bring into it filmmaking, for example, music, a lot of these kind of professions, young people start unpaid, you know, and even 
are kind of exploited by some workplaces, but that's kind of obviously a long topic of discussion. We move on now to the, the last quick fire 13 questions, which we ask all, yet, all uh, your take guests. So always interested to hear the answers. So John Azelwood, these are the things you like, don't like, and I'm interested to hear your answers. Number one, what would you say is your favorite pastime? Um, it involves children. Everything involves children. I like my, my, my little boy plays in a football team. And I love to take him training and I love to go to the games with him because he gets so excited and so wound up. It's a massive part in his life. And also, this sounds incredibly dull and I'm, I'm sorry to be so dull, but I really love watching the television with my daughter. The series that she likes, she's again, she's got a level of obsession and I can totally, totally get into the level of obsession. And so with her, with her, I watched every single episode of Parks and Recreation, loved it. And she pauses every five minutes going, let me tell you about this. Let me put this into context. And at the moment, we're uh, into series six in the American version of The Office. And we try and watch a little bit every day. That's what I love doing. How old are your children? Um, the boy's 11 and he's a goalkeeper. And uh, the, my daughter, is she's 14. So uh, that also brings its own challenges. An area and medium that we haven't touched upon in this discussion is cinema. And I wanted to ask you your favourite film and why. Um, <clears throat> I think probably Field of Dreams. But my problem is that I'm not, I'm, I've only ever seen it once and I dare not watch it again. I'm not one of life's criers. I saw this film, Field of Dreams, and I absolutely bawled my eyes out for the last 20 minutes thank the lord i was watching it on my own and it's proper it's not just a, you know, it's not with tears it was massive sobs i've never ever had a reaction like that to any film and honestly i i don't watch it again and and i know that's a strange one for for favorites but oh, crikey just oh Kevin Costner, of course. <laughs> I, I watched it during the lockdown. I also watched, because um, he did another baseball film, Bull Durham. I don't know if you've seen I don't, Bull I, Durham I, I, as well. No. <clears throat> did, did you cry for, for, through Field of Dreams? Or did um, you just me? I didn't, but it's, um, <laughs> it's quite an uplifting film, isn't it? With a moral message about <sighs> kind of family and memories and, yeah, dreams, aspirations. I, 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 I have... I have no explanation or, or understanding. And I, I, I believe, favourite film or not, I don't think I'll ever watch it again in my life. From a writer's perspective, I'm interested to hear who is your favourite novelist? Well, uh, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned John Irving before. And obviously, I, I think A Prayer for Owing Meaning is, I think, possibly my, my favourite book of all time. And I stuck with John Irving for for slightly too long, I think. I think his, his, his later work hasn't quite matched that. But Owen Meany is a, a, an astonishing book. At the moment, at the moment, I, I'm, I'm getting into John Updike. Uh, I went through his his Rabbit trilogy, and crikey, that's astonishing writing. You'd sort of you. It's one of those things you go back and look at a paragraph, and you think, how on earth did he do that? And the, 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 the subject matter of the, the Rabbit trilogy is so mundane. That small town America, this not particularly likable central figure with his not particularly likable family and his not particularly likable friends. But the, the story that it tells over these, these three books uh, is it's very, very moving, but it's so beautifully, so exquisitely written. Imagine. Imagine being able to write like John Updike. Crikey. If you could have had a, a different profession, what would it have been? Well, if I was only good at football, I'd like to be a footballer, but that's absolutely, that was obviously too late now, but that, that was absolutely impossible. I mean, my, my, my problem here is that I have no other skills. There is simply nothing else I'm capable of doing. I can't really change your views. If I come and did your garden, I'd mess it up for generations. I can't cook. 
I can't do anything else other than string words together in a vaguely coherent form for the deadline that you set me. That's what I can do. And I, there's, there's, I don't have any other options. The, the, the next one, who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Um, I, I've been thinking about this. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult one because um, I think in a sense that you're, you're, you're always inspired by your parents. You know, my, my dad's been dead a few years now, but I know, I know that he was, when I had a triumph, he was so, so proud and he was so, uh, so pleased that I was meeting people that he'd heard of, people that he was familiar with, people, you know, you go and interview Neil Diamond. And he said, yeah, I went and interviewed him in California, in his studio. And the, the best thing about that was how pleased it, it made my father. And likewise, he was a big, as I mentioned before, he's a big football man. He loved football. And the fact that he, he'd taken me to see Sheffield Wednesday in all the, the dog years, you know, for literally hundreds of games. And then when I could say to him, look, I'm going to see Sheffield Wednesday and I'm in the Wednesday press box. You know, those things, those things made him incredibly proud. And if, you know, if I had a, 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 a something that was the opposite of a triumph, i.e. a disappointment or whatever, then he'd always be fantastically encouraging. I've tried to shield him a bit from it. But he always and he always had faith. He always had faith. So I think that was that was absolutely inspirational. You've written for many many newspaper publications here in the UK. But I'm interested to find out: Do you read a newspaper, and if so, which one? Um, I read the the newspapers that I write for, uh, of course, just to find out what they're about in the wider world. But I read all the others as well. I read every newspaper, not not every single day, every page. That'd be ludicrous, and I, or I would have earned no money that week. But um, I love newspapers. I love them. Whenever I go to a town, I buy the local newspaper and pour through it to see what's happening there, see what they're doing, see what's 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 happening in in their journalism. I don't feel partisan towards it. Something you know. I, I mentioned the Daily Mail before, you know, it's obviously quite a, 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 a leans significantly to the right. I don't lean significantly to the right, but I think it's a great paper. What would you say is your favourite food? Oh, that's a hard one. That is just, that's, that's possibly, possibly the hardest question that you, you, you've asked today. I, uh, at the moment, it changes. So at the moment, I'm into Chinese hot pot. Which is where, which is where you go to, you sit at your table, you get a, a bowl of broth, which is either bone broth or tomato broth or something much, much more spicy. And you select your raw food items and you cook them for yourself. That's great. I love that. I love, I love doing it with the kids. It's brilliant. So at the moment that, but come back next week and then I'll, I'll tell you how much I like fish and chips or, or fusion food. Next, we're talking about icons, but I wanted to ask, who is your favourite cultural icon? That's, again, these, these questions are fascinating, but they're hard. Um, I think it's in, in, in terms of, of culture, I think if you, if you look, maybe he's just retired, so he's kind of in the news at the moment a bit, but Jon Snow, I think. Mm. I, I, I love the way that he conducts himself, but also, also I had a little personal experience of him. Because when I was a kid, uh, I did a, an A-level project uh, on the Sandinistas. Of course, this was just borrowed from the Clash album, but from the actual uh, the actual revolution in Nicaragua. I did a I did a massive project on it, and Jon Snow, bless him, had just come back from there, where he'd been he'd been in Managua for many months, reporting on the the Nicaraguan revolution, mm. and actually sent him a letter and uh, said, Look, "Can you tell me?" what it's like, what you did and everything for my school project. And incredibly, absolutely incredibly, he wrote back, well, not just wrote back, he sent me this extraordinarily long letter detailing exactly all his experiences, all that had happened. And I just thought even then, wow, you're taking all that time just to do that for me, for a school project. And so ever since then, ever since then, he, he, I knew clearly then 
he was a good man. But nothing that happened in the subsequent years has changed my uh, opinion of him at all. Nice story, and I agree with you. I always thought he was a, a fine journalist and a, a great uh, front man for Channel 4 News as well. Um, sadly, finished not so long ago. Next one, you can say this, pre the watershed, what is your favourite curse word? And oh, I love all the curse words. But I think, I think my favourite is twat which is, is, is borrowed again from, from the John Cooper Clark poem of that name. They can't find a good word for you, but I can. Twat. I love it. Next one. What would you say is your favourite place or holiday destination? Oh, that's, that's, again, again, uh, that's, that's a fascinating one. I like cities. I'm a big, big fan of cities. Yeah, I, same here. I, I, I cannot move away from them. I think... I think when going, going to Brazil and going to Sao Paulo, which obviously is the, the great, great city in the Southern Hemisphere, the absolute sprawling nature, it was like been in, uh, on another planet almost. And there, there I experienced the heaviest rain that I've ever, ever experienced. It's like nothing like it. It was rain coming down in, in sort of giant, giant drops. And, that was also, again, surreal. Just the, 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 if, when you can feel in a city, when you can feel different, when you can feel very, very foreign and very, very strange, that you're in a world that, is, that is, is, you're slightly out of your depth. I love that feeling. This can be a, a tricky one for you because you have a variety of musical tastes and styles, but if you only had to pick one, who would you say is your favourite music artist? Um, what is your favourite album? I think my favourite artists are overall are Sparks. I mentioned before that I saved all my money as a kid on holiday to come home with, come home to my house. And then <clears throat> I must have been about sort of nine or ten then. And they've been with me for the rest of my life. They've turned out album after album. I think that they're, they're in the sort of mid to late 20s now in terms of albums. Of course, they made the, the recent documentary film as well, the Edgar yes. Wright. Yes, uh, the Edgar Wright. Yeah, Edgar Wright recently. So, but the, the, the incredible thing about Sparks is that, that throughout those years, they've stayed with me. And the quality, the quality has never, and I, I use this word advisedly, their quality has never dropped. I cannot think of an act who maintained that level of quality. And of course, there was a period 20 years ago when I was an absolute lone voice. I remember desperately trying to get the, to get them into Q, the magazine that I worked for. And I think I droned on about it for so long that they said, but go and interview them for God's sake, and come back and write a piece. And there was no one else who's, who's, who likes Sparks. They're getting their respect now. But in the sort of uh, 80s, 90s, and the early parts of this century, then they were seen as washed up, but they were never washed up. Their albums are astonishing. And to keep doing that, and often also in the face of indifference, is, is incredible. And you know, I think me going to Russell Mail's house, that's wow. Just one of those great things. The final two questions though, John. The first one, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Um, well, on a, on a mundane level, it's doing stuff for so long still loving it on a much more specific level which I suggest is maybe what you want um it was good I, I was very pleased with myself to get to to go to Moscow and get home because while I was in Moscow in a, an act of jaw-dropping stupidity even by my own standards I managed to leave my passport in a cab um and and this was of course was at the time then it was changing from the, the Soviet Union to Russia so it was a very, very feral period at that moment. And to be an English person there without a passport, is, you're in a really difficult situation. And I was on my own because I was actually going to Siberia with a photographer. <laughs> the, the, the photographer had to go to meet the, the, to, to, uh, to the meeting point in, in Siberia. So I was stuck on my own in Moscow. And I had, luckily, I, I, I'd left a sack full, a plastic bag full of rubles in the cab as well, but I kept my dollars to myself. And it was Russia, you know, Moscow in late at night in the winter. It's not a pleasant place for a, a 
Western guy on his own. So I had to uh, go through, I went to the hotels and the first couple I went to, no one would give me a room because I didn't have my passport. It was clearly, obviously I wasn't Russian. Um, and then eventually I, I got the idea that the only thing that I could ever do was to bribe my way in. So I went to the reception and said, look, I've got a hundred dollars or whatever it was, give me a room. And she eventually goes, yeah, yeah. And she put me into a room which was already occupied. There's nobody there that night for whatever reason. So I slept in, in, in a bed, which, you know, we, we, I, we must move on. It wasn't a very nice bed, that's all I'm saying. Um, and stayed there for the night. And then the next day, the next day, I turned up at the British Embassy thinking, God, what do, what do I do without my passport? And I was gre greeted at the door by a man from the British Embassy with my sack of rubles and my passport in his hand. I, I'd left it with the, with the most honest taxi driver in Moscow. And I absolutely, it was, again, I've never been so relieved in all my life to have met this man. And he, he was there looking at the passport. And, God, yeah, 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 it's you. Yeah, here you are. Here's your sack of rubles. See ya. And yeah, then, then I had to make my own way to Siberia, which is, of course, a, a different story entirely. But I did all that. I met up eventually with the people and then eventually came back. But getting out of that situation was, uh, I, I, for me, for me, it was a fabulous achievement. I, you know, I think I could still be in Moscow now, all these decades later. Um, so maybe that. And then finally, John Azerwood, how do you wish to be remembered? Um, well, I'd like to be remembered as, a, as the greatest writer who ever lived, but clearly, clearly, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So I, I think, I think I, I'd like to be professionally remembered as, as someone who did better than he'd hoped. I think that's a no, nice note to end on. Thank you very kindly for giving up your time and joining us for the last 60 minutes for your take. I've enjoyed listening to your passion for writing, for music, for football, and it's certainly come across uh, during our discussion. But before we wrap up, I just wanted to finish off by asking you to tell us where we see, where we hear, where we can read more about you and your work. Well, at the moment, as, as, as I mentioned before, I've just got a, a new book out on Joy Division and New Order, and it's called Decades. And some of my other books are available possibly for under a pound on Amazon, if you, if you hurry. Um, Television-wise, you can see me on the, the Greatest Hits of the, the 70s on Channel 5, and that's going to be followed very soon by the Greatest Hits of the 80s. And there's also an awful lot of, of documentaries on Sky Arts, which uh, keep getting repeated, which is excellent. Journalistic wise, then I will be writing football match reports for the Daily and Sunday Telegraph. I'll do, be doing a lot of sporting interviews for the Sunday Times and possibly the Times too. Um, I do book reviews for the I newspaper. And you can also read me reviewing records in Mojo and in Classic Rock and doing interviews for them too. And also I preview television programmes for the Radio Times. A busy, busy man. I wish you all the very best for the future, you and your family. And thank you once again for being a guest on your take today. Thanks very much for having me. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Thank you.